Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our core class. Uh, this is a session that we're going to be going through. is called Give Generously, and this is Matt Hess. Uh, Matt is one of our church council members. He's also one of our small group leaders. Uh, I think you have been around since 1781. Is that just right? Just about. Just, just about. Feels like it. But yeah. uh, I've loved every minute of it. Love this church and glad to be here tonight. I, Matt's a good friend, and I'm looking forward to getting to teach, teach with him tonight. Well, I, I just want to talk about this class. This little book that we've been going through has just been outstanding. I agree. Uh, it's really, really, really uh, helped me uh, just in being a, a pastor, just to rethink, rethink things, and uh, maybe, not maybe, make some attitude adjustments. Uh, I agree. I agree. I, it's been challenging to me to see just what a, a, a true willing church member uh, I am called to be uh, as as a member of this church and as a, a Christian in general, uh, how we should love the church and serve the church. Yeah. And uh, it's been convicting in a very good way for me. Yeah. And I'm going to be real transparent tonight uh, and this chapter uh, I just have never really thought about the word generous very much. Uh, yeah. And it's used all the time in scripture. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a very unique word. And we're going to, I can't wait to just talk about how it should be, should be a word that others use of every Christian. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I think it's, it's a word that a lot of us want to be called and we really, really think highly of people that we use that word yeah. to describe. Um, but when you really examine yourself and whether you're truly generous, uh -huh. that's where it, uh, uh, it, it gets convicting to think about that word and how we're called to be generous in scripture and whether we truly are. Yeah. So I just want you to know that as we're talking, if you feel like your toes are getting stomped on a little bit. Uh, it, Mine too. Yeah. Well, ours have already been stomped <laughs> on and probably will be again tonight as well as we go through it. So let's just go ahead and we're going to start with a word of prayer and then we're just going to uh, dive right in. Father, would you just speak to us tonight? That, uh, would you just speak through Matt and me uh, tonight? Help us just be able to share exactly what you have laid on our hearts. Pray for those that are going to be listening, mm -hmm. uh, maybe for the first time and joining us in the core class because of our new schedule and what we're having to go through. But I just pray that, that this truly would become a characteristic that all of us are working on and we're asking your spirit to make in us, make us generous people. And we ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, there's some, uh, there's some words that we want to talk about, and I think it's always good to kind of start off with a definition. I'm really thankful for Mike Poole and all of our media arts team to get this set up for us tonight. So we're going to be using this back here, making reference to it as well. But the very first thing that we want to just talk about and define it are some words. Uh, the title of the book or this chapter is called Give Generously. So what does it mean to give? Hmm. Uh, well, let's take a look at, let's take a, look at a, a definition. The definition for give is to present voluntarily and without, expect, and without expecting compensation. Uh, th that means that you're just giving something without asking or even expecting anything re in return for it. You mean I can't control it once I give it away? Well, you can try. It's not but really that's a gift. really not a gift then, is it? All right. Nope. It's called with strings attached, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I also think it's really helpful for us to know antonyms. So an antonym is something that is exactly the opposite of what the word is that you're, mm -hmm. you're describing. To, to me, that at times defines something even more clearly than the, act, sure. than the actual definition. So some antonyms for the word give is deny, disapprove, Hold, keep, refuse, retain, take, withhold, neglect, hold up. I think those are just really, really good words for us to truly understand what it, what it means to give. You want to talk about generous? 
yeah. generously? Yeah, if you look at the, the word generously, the definition we found was uh, to be liberal in giving or sharing, to be unselfish. Uh, liberal in giving and sharing. Not just giving, mm -hmm. but liberal in giving and sharing. To me, that means giving much or sharing much, being quick to give and easy uh, to give to someone. And then, of course, unselfish uh, kind of jumps us into that same discussion of antonyms. Yeah. Certainly an antonym of being unselfish would be selfish. Yeah. Uh, but others that we found were, were poorly, uh, coldly, grudgingly, heartlessly, wow. self, selfishly, sparingly, sparingly, or stingily. Ugh, stingily. Nobody yeah. likes to be called stingy. No. Um, and that's certainly the opposite of being generous. So, yeah, I really appreciate you finding those antonyms, Jeff, because it, it does put even more light on what the definition of the terms are that we're trying to, uh, to deal with tonight. So, yeah, generously is, is, a, is a big word and one that uh, we'll come back to many times tonight. Yeah, so I get the picture of somebody that is an antonym of somebody who's generous as Scrooge. Scrooge, yeah. I think that's a perfect, if you, mm -hmm. I like visuals, mm -hmm. and to me, Scrooge is the perfect guy. I don't think anyone would have ever, ever characterized him as being generous. No, no. So there you go. you got something to kind of think, of, think about there. So we want to go through and we want to uh, share with you some scripture, but then also talk about how we can apply that to our lives. So we're just going to dive in right now. And we're going to look at point number one. Right up here is called the greatest sermon ever. And the greatest sermon ever, what that's really referencing is a sermon on the mount. That's where we get the Beatitudes. And we're going to take a look in Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to just read through that, that uh, a couple of verses there, verses 19 through 21. So it says this. This is Jesus speaking to a crowd that has just amassed around him, and they are just amazed by his teaching. And he says this to them, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, so, you know, whenever you read this, this is, a, this is so counterculture to us. I mean, kind of the American dream is, you know, to go and to have a house and to, to provide more for your children than what you have and to amass as much as you can. And that's kind of how we look at ourselves and judge ourselves. And Jesus is going through here and he's just blowing it out of the water. He's just really just redefining what it means to truly follow him. So a question that we might ask in this, is it bad for us to save, to invest, to plan for the future or to have and enjoy nice things? And uh, I, I would say very clearly, scripture tells us it's not bad because it gives us references that we should store, mm -hmm. that we should plan, that we should prepare for things. But there's two words that really catch what Jesus is saying here. And those two words are, the, the key to this passage are these two words, for yourselves. Now, in your notes, I would highly encourage you just to, to underline those words, for yourself. So let's, let's talk about this. Whenever we think about storing up stuff for ourselves, what that's really pointing to is to greed, self-interest, pleasure-seeking, we even get the picture of hoarding. We've seen those TV shows on people that are hoarders. And then, you know, there's a, there's a, a phrase that's out that, that younger people than me are using, and it's, it's YOLO, and that means you only live once. Mm -hmm. And so everything I'm doing on is focused what I want, what I want to enjoy, what's going to give me the greatest ple pleasure. And Jesus is very clearly teaching us and warning us that's not how we're supposed to live. Jesus doesn't want bad things for us. In fact, actually what he wants is the best 
thing for us. And this is why he's telling us not to invest in the things that are going to go away, the things that are going to rust, the things that people could steal, the things that could de decay, or even as a for my very first worship pastor that I worked, or, worked with, uh, when when people would start talking about things that they were trying to accumulate or showing the, the nice things that they had just purchased, he would just quip back to them and say, that'll burn. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I thought that was, at first I was thinking, wow, that's just re really rude. Yeah. But then it was, you know what? He, you're making a really good point. Really making a good point here. So, you know, we're living in some really interesting days. Very unprecedented, unprecedented days. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Sarah and I are, are watching everything that's going on. Uh, we've got children that are saving up to, to adopt a baby. Mm -hmm. we're, we've got a, a, our oldest son is getting ready to start this church in St. Louis. And we're all, and we're thinking, how is this going to work? We're also thinking about our retirement. I mean, we still have quite a ways away, but to be honest, we're thinking about our, our retirement. And, you know, uh, I think all of us are thinking about finances, especially if you watch the start, stock market. And then we've got people in our church and in our community that are losing jobs because they're being let go and laid off because the businesses are closing. Uh, Jesus is concerned about that, and we are too, but it's so easy to slip into this focus on just finances and finances and material possessions that we can, that we can accumulate. Uh, if you haven't thought about your finances, then we probably need to either check your pulse or maybe we ought to get you tested for the coronavirus. Uh, what Jesus is really teaching us here in this passage is that all of the things of this world are going to pass away. I love, I love it whenever he talks about this is not our home. And why do we work so hard to make this place our home instead of really focusing on the things that matter the most. And that's what Jesus is teaching us is, is that we need to have the right focus. And the right focus that we're supposed to have is on treasures in heaven. Uh, that's heavenly things. We're supposed to be working towards storing up heavenly things in, in treasure. And did you catch that whenever he says that what we're supposed to be doing is storing up things in heavens, He's actually telling us that that's for us. So he's not telling us not to do anything for ourselves. It's just what is our focus in what we're doing? Is it for ourselves or are we doing it here on earth or are we doing it to store up in heaven? So a, a, a really good question is this, how do we store up things in heaven? And here's some things that are on your notes, and you can download those notes by going to our, our website, and you can go to sv.church forward slash core hyphen classes and download the notes. There's also a link on our Facebook page as well. So here's the first way that we can store up things in heaven. Number one, share the gospel. Anytime that we share the gospel with someone, uh, scripture tells us that anytime that we preach, anytime that we share Scripture, anytime that we share our testimony, that that never comes back empty. That means that that's an investment that lasts. And it's mm -hmm. one that could potentially change a life here that's going to change a life forever. So anytime that we share the gospel, it's always a beautiful thing. Second way that we can store up things in heaven is, is this way. Every kind act, every act of kind, kindness that, that we do is going to receive a, roar, a reward in heaven. And you can find that scripture, scripture passage in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. There's a promise there that every time that we do something out of kindness... Not trying to get anything out of it, though. Out of kindness that we're going to be re rewarded in heaven. And then the third thing that we can do to store up things in heaven is that when we give to the poor, Scripture tells us that we are literally 
giving it to Jesus. Now that's pretty cool. That that, is cool. That's really cool. He says that he will pay us, repay us, not just here on earth, but he's also going to repay us in heaven. And you can look up Proverbs nineteen seventeen there. So here's just some real quick quotes about money and about generosity that in researching and reading the book and then some reading some other books that I thought were really, really good. One is that generosity or the lack of is a heart issue. That means that we've got an inward character flaw that we need to work on. Another one is, is where our treasure is that that's where our heart is also. Pastors use this all the time. I don't know how many times I've heard this little quote that money is the mirror of our heart. And I think that that's really good. It, you know, it, they used to say if you looked at someone's checkbook, you could really see what was what what was their idol or their god. Yeah. Now it'd probably have to be their bank statement with their with their debit eight, card. Debit card. Yeah. yeah. Uh, th- I think those are just really good. And the last one is this: our heart will all- always follow our investments. So what the pastor is saying there is where are we invested? And that's going to show where where our heart is. Are we investing in things of the earth or are we investing in things in heaven? Wow. Wow. Great stuff, Jeff. I appreciate you handling that and talking about that, that first section. You know, it's, it's challenging to think about, you know, are we truly generous and are we storing up treasures in heaven or just treasures, as you say, that will burn yeah. here, here on earth? Well, um, well, I'm going to take the next section. Uh, it's good to be with you all tonight. Uh, w- one thing we wanted to talk about, the book uh, talks about, is just kind of a, a shift that's occurred over really a long period of time yeah. about um, trends in church giving and also trends in how and how churches talk about giving. Mm-hmm. Now, you've been at this a while. 38 years. Just a years. few years. Yeah, 38 years. Just a years. few years. Well, I, I may ask you if you've observed uh, some of this as, as we talk about it, but um, um, historically, people will tell you in the 70s and 80s, a lot of evangelical churches um, started to move away from talking about mm-hmm. giving, mm-hmm. And, and in particular about tithing. Um, and, and the, the thought, I think at the time, you correct me if I'm wrong, was it was a little delicate. You're getting real personal when yeah. you talk about somebody's finances. Um, and uh, a lot of churches, because they thought that might hurt their attendance yeah. and it might not make the people in the crowd real happy, uh, shied away from preaching a lot on tithing and giving. Is that I, fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. I also think it had to do with televangelism too. Oh, How so? Because they started seeing where televangelists were living Mm -hmm. and the cars and the airplanes and the trips that they were going on. And so the givers became a little bit uh, uh, concerned about where their money was going. And then the pastors of churches then started feeling a little bit of that heat. Okay. And that as well. So just... So we're clear, you don't have an airplane, right? A paper. A paper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, All right. Two of those? Yeah, at least. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, um, you know, we, we see this uh, or we've seen this shift away from an emphasis on uh, giving in terms of what people might have heard from the pulpit mm-hmm. over uh, a few decades. And, and we just came up with some results. I did some looking for some statistics on this and uh, I came up with a, a couple, two or three that I thought were real interesting. Uh, one was that somewhere between 10 and 25% is, is all of the percentage of uh, current churchgoers that would actually uh, give a tithe. Uh, and I think some people, it's fair to say, would think it's lower than that. Yeah. If, um, and, and just so we're clear, it's not, nobody's looking at your column here at the church or anything, but you, you can tell by the number of folks that attend a church mm-hmm. and the number of folks that are on a membership roll um, that um, tithing doesn't occur. But, but this, um, this is a survey result uh, from a national nonprofit organization that evaluates these things. And their numbers were somewhere between 10 and 25% yeah. may tithe. Yeah. Um, and then um, 
the, the current average in terms of what just the average Christian does give as part of their income, uh, last year in 2019 was estimated to be 2.5%. Yeah. Um, now, the, the, the next statistic I think is real interesting. Pretty shocking. During the Great Depression, the average giving uh, of a Christian church member was 3.3%. So we're going backwards. We've gone backwards in, in good 2019, times. good times, uh, where the economy is doing well. We're going backwards in comparison to the worst financial crisis yeah. of the last century, the Great Depression. Um, so just think about that. Here we are now, as we sit here in March of 2020, we're in one of the most disruptive economic times of my lifetime. Uh, I've never seen anything uh, like yeah. this. And uh, a lot of individuals and families, certainly folks my age, have not seen anything like this. We, you know, there are those who have lived through, um, uh, a few maybe that have lived through the Depression, and, yeah. uh, um, and many that have lived through the, the World Wars that um, um, may have seen something like this during, during World War II. But, uh, but in terms of some disruptive economic times, for many of us, this is, this is uh, as crazy as it's been. Yeah. Um, at least short term, and we are starting at a point of giving to the church that's lower than we were in the Great Depression. Yeah. Um, what does that say about our need to be generous to the church in these days, Jeff? I think we've got some work. I think we do. I think we've I think got we some do. work. And, uh, you know, I, I think advertising also mm -hmm. has taken, uh, you know, if you look back to the Great Depression, they didn't have TVs. They weren't inundated with all of the ads mm -hmm. and compelled to make us think that we had to have this to have have joy in in life. Yeah, uh, it was just it was an easier time and not not as confusing time, and we weren't stimulated by all of the media that we are today. Yeah, and it wasn't so easy not to make an excuse. It wasn't so easy to be parted with your money. Yeah. It seems like. Now, I'm not saying that those folks back in days long ago didn't have better discipline than maybe me and my generation or a younger yeah. generation. But regardless of your age, you can one-click order things. Oh, um, things at a fingertip. You can buy things you can't afford so easily uh, these days. So uh, I think that's another part of it yeah. uh, in, in that we need to exercise some discipline so we yeah. can be generous. Most definitely. Can be Most generous. Definitely. So uh, one thing, you know, we, we've, uh, we're not piling on our preachers tonight for, for failing to preach on tithing. That's not the point. Bring it um, on. We, 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 we talk about that time period in our uh, church history. Uh, but what else contributes uh, to this decline in giving? Uh, because some of the statistics will tell you that, um, you know, giving to charities hasn't necessarily gone down, but religious giving yeah. has gone down. So what else could be contributing uh, to that? Um, you know, as we talked about, uh, some of the teaching left the, the tithing and the generosity teaching because of a desire to not make uh, church members or church attenders uncomfortable. Well, e even more than that teaching, our, our churches, uh, we've been guilty sometimes of being really worried about what folks think that are attending our church. Mm -hmm. And while we want to serve and minister people and share the gospel uh, with them, that has sometimes created an expectation in us church members. Again, I'll throw myself in that category that the church is there to meet my expectations. Yeah. The church is there to, you know, help Jeff and his family or Matt and his family or, or Joe and his family. Yeah. Um, and so we think the church is about uh, us and what that leads to uh, I believe, and, and our writer in the, in the book uh, believes, is, you know, we start thinking the church is about us and we think things ought to go our way yeah. or things ought to be done our way or that everything should be agreeable with us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we, we are guilty, I think, as church members of sometimes uh, maybe being a little resentful if something doesn't go our way or if we disagree with a policy or a decision. And sometimes that can affect are giving as well. Would oh, you yeah. agree, Jeff? Oh, I've seen that. I've, yeah. I've had that vocalized yeah. to me. 
that it, you know, if, if this doesn't go this way, I'm going to hold my money. Right. Or I'm going to leave. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to, I'm just going to go to another church. So, yeah. And I, you know, I think this, this book, the I will is trying to point out all of those things, but specifically this is one way that they, that they are, are taking action by saying, I'm, I'm not going to give anymore because I don't support what you're doing. Right. Right. And, and, you know, that doesn't just happen with individual church members. We hear, we hear in the news sometimes where a church may disagree with a convention yeah. on an issue yeah. and they will take a stance that they don't want to support a convention or uh, an association because of a disagreement with a decision. I think that grows out of that same spirit. It does. So it's not just church members that are sometimes guilty of that. Sometimes it can be, you know, a, a church as a whole yeah. can be guilty of, of not supporting That's financially an really association or a convention. Um, so uh, that's not a proper response, as we know, no. and, and not, not being up here to, to preach at folks. I can find myself having a tendency to say, man, I don't like that decision. Or I, you know, I would do that differently, maybe. And you just have to be humble and fight that urge um, to be stingy, I guess. I think that's uh, just, uh, I think it's nature for us to think that our way is the best. Oh, yeah. We've and, always got it figured out. Yeah. And uh, it's just become just much more evident and also accepted for people to be much more vocal nowadays. Right. And uh, not just vocal, but then taking action as well. And I just don't see where in Scripture this is a way that's glorifying God, to right. be honest. Right, right. So we asked the question, is that... Is that attitude a proper response? And no, no, it's not. And I think we have to get back to, again, we, we've been valued as individuals by our culture, by social media. We've all got a voice uh, by our churches yeah. because we've um, uh, expressed or, or practiced things that are uh, uh, motivated by a desire to uh, have people in our audience that are, are pleased with what's going on at the church. We, we've let ourselves become as individuals very self-centered. Yeah. Um, so what's the response to that? And I think it, it goes back to uh, the gospel itself. Are they, are they our funds to begin with? Um, and when you, when you look at the whole of scripture, we know that uh, we come into the world with nothing and uh, we'll, we'll leave with nothing except yeah. uh, our faith in Christ uh, and the promises that go along with that. Uh, but all the material blessings that we receive in our lives are gifts from God. Our ability to work and earn money, uh, our, our intellect where we can get an education yeah. and, and obtain a degree, uh, all of the funds that we can gather or property we can gather or material goods we can gather uh, are the result of God's blessings. So they're not even our funds yeah. to begin with, are yeah. they, Jeff? No. No, in fact, Scripture uses the word uh, manager, uh, or a steward, and that means that there, it's not ours, but we've been given that to oversee mm -hmm. for the purpose that the Lord intends, uh, which is, again, totally counterculture. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, what are you telling me what to do with the money that I have instead of this is God's, and I'm going to, and I'm watching over it to do what he wants me to do with it. Yeah. Totally yeah. different mindset. Different mindset. Another question we can ask ourselves is, what's the purpose of the church? Yeah. Um, you know, what is the purpose of the church? The purpose of the church is to proclaim God's word, the gospel of Jesus, uh, to a lost and dying world. We're objects of God's grace, that we're not in that lost and dying world, that we've received the gospel, that we've responded, um, and, and that we are saved uh, by the, the, the work of Jesus Christ. So the, the purpose of the church is to make much of Jesus yeah. in worship and in teaching. And that leads to my next question. What other organization, what other thing that you could invest in is going to do that? Nothing. Nothing. Is, is a club or a school I love our schools. My wife's an educator. Even even a nonprofit. 
uh, another nonprofit, uh, is a sports team. I mean, where else do we put our money yeah. and our energy that is going to make much of Jesus in worship and teaching? And, and there's and, nothing else. And even go back to storing up treasures in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, the church is the only thing that is challenged and tasked to share the gospel. Yeah, yeah. The only thing. Yeah, and we, when we withhold our gifts from the church, the only thing that's going to share the gospel, it's a reflection of our heart. If we don't trust God Great point. Uh, through the church to handle our money, uh, when we give it back to him, what's that say about our faith? I mean, what else in, in your, uh, you know, are you trusting in your works to save you from your yeah. sin? Yeah. If you know the gospel, I know you're not. But then we want to trust in our own decisions or uh, our own objections to something that's going on as opposed to giving it up to God when we, when we give it. Um, I wanted to share another bit of scripture here before we end this section. In Romans 11, uh, we see this scripture. It's Romans 11 verses 35 uh, and 36. Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. It just asks that question. Have we ever given anything to God that he owes us anything back? When we're um, uh, selfish and hanging on to our gifts or not generous, uh, it's like we're, we're acting like God owes us something back. Yeah. And I know if we read the gospel, I know if our church members, when, when we really sit down and think about it, we... We know that's not a right response to God. I know that's not right thinking when I have it. So, so as you see, we're, we're all called to give back to God. Uh, just a portion of what he gave to us, we're, we're called to do that uh, with humility. Mm. And we just need to trust and know that, you know, God can multiply those gifts and use them for far greater things than they're going to ever accomplish uh, with us in control of that. So I would just, uh, I, I would ask you all to, uh, like me, try to humble yourselves. Yeah. Um, Good word. Uh, and, uh, and I'm going to try to do that as well for those times I think that way uh, and give it up to God and let him do great things with it. Great word. Great so, word. Um, the next section we're going to talk about, uh, cheerful giving. Some great scripture that we're going to cover now um, that was mentioned in, in, in the book. We're going to put that up next. 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6 through 11. I put uh, a little bit more than what was in the, um, uh, in the material. Um, but but uh, in this, Paul is going to talk about cheerful giving. So what do we think of, Jeff, when we think... Um, well, let, let me read the scripture first. We'll, okay. we'll cover that first, okay? Uh, so 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. Verse 6 starts, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. In verse 10 here, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way mm. so that you can be generous on every occasion. Mm. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving uh, to God. Uh, this scripture in 2 Corinthians is part of a whole series of, of scriptures in that book. They kind of turn human logic upside down. Yeah. You were talking about the Sermon on the Mount, yeah. which did the same thing uh, earlier. We, if you kind of go through uh, the book of 2 Corinthians, you'll see Paul talking about finding strength in weakness. In, in chapter 1, he talks about comfort amidst affliction. Mm -hmm. He talks about blessing through suffering in chapter 6. He talks about generosity coming, uh, uh, having a, a swelling up of generosity despite poverty right. in chapter 8. So uh, like a lot uh, of, of true biblical teaching, um, Paul's got a countercultural view of generosity here. If you go back to chapter 8, 
the Macedonian Christians were being praised by Paul because they were going through a severe trial and famine. I love this story. And, and even in the middle of that, they were generous. And he brags on them for yeah. being generous. And, and when I think of a severe trial and famine, we're going through some, some rocky financial times now in our country. But I'm thinking in, uh, in first century Macedonia, when they describe a trial, a severe trial and a famine, this it was, must have been bad. Yeah, this was, this was a, a really difficult, first of all, they weren't really prosperous in, in the first place. Right. And so Paul is telling the Macedonian Christians about this and they feel compelled to give. And then Paul challenges them, don't forget about your gift and the promise that you've made to, to do this. And they're giving to the church in Jerusalem. Yeah. To the church that started everything. So here's the church that started everything. And all these other churches now are, are their babies out there. Mm -hmm. And now the babies are coming back and they're helping, helping the, the mother church, which is just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and Paul records it in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 4. He says that they, the Macedonian Christians, urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. These were poor people who had already been generous yeah. and they were pleading for oh, the stop, privilege. Don't stop me from giving. Yes. They're, they're asking, yeah, begging for the ability to give to this church. Yeah. And this is not a church that's right down the road. This mm -hmm. is a church that's uh, a, a long way away. They probably will never meet yeah. most of the people in that church. They're hearing about that church, not through social media or email or Twitter. They're hearing about this church through messengers that bring letters. And they're um, not keeping that church under their eye on how they're going right. to use those funds. And, and they're still pleading yeah. for that privilege yeah. Give me the opportunity. of giving. Nothing motivates people like that except the gospel yeah. of Jesus Christ. If we're grateful believers, uh, that should be our goal, yeah. to, to plead for the privilege uh, of giving. So we see there in chapter 9, Paul is, is uh, again, I've said it a couple of times, he turns, turns the world's logic on its head. He promises that we will be enriched and blessed when we give generously. Yeah. I mean, the, these are, again, are not wealthy uh, folks that he's talking about. Um, but, but he says um, uh, back in, in um, whoops, lost my spot there, Jeff. <laughs> uh, he says in, in uh, verse 11 of 2 Corinthians uh, 9, you will be enriched in every way mm -hmm. so that you can be generous on every occasion. He's talking about how fulfilled they'll be, their, their lives will be enriched, uh, and they'll, they'll be able to give uh, generously uh, to the church. Yeah, and you don't see anywhere in that passage an amount. Mm -hmm. So the generosity is not based off of the amount that they gave, but it was their heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it was their willingness and their desire to be able to share with others and to share with the church so then the church can do its ministry and to take care of the people that are in that church and in the community. And they were just chomping at the bit mm -hmm. to, be, to be involved in that. What yeah. a beautiful picture. Yeah. And as you said, 2 Corinthians 9 verses, um, verse 7 there says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. In, a, in other words, like you said, it's not an amount. It's not reluctant. It's not under compulsion, but God loves a cheerful giver. So uh, if we break this down just a little bit more, how are we called to give in these passages? We're called to give cheerfully. Yeah. Uh, now, now, cheerful here is the same root word that our word hilarious comes from. I love that. Um, which gives a picture of people almost... Well, laughing and, yeah. and being so full of joy, they're expressing it through laughter as they give uh, to the church. That's how cheerful of a picture uh, this is. So we are to give uh, joyfully, joyfully. Well, think, think of someone laughing, mm -hmm. okay? You know, you've got somebody that just laughs and you can tell that they're really, that it really means, but have you, 
you know the face of somebody that's just laughing <laughs> hilariously? Yeah. I mean, where it's just hurting, hurting mm -hmm. on the side, can't get a breath. And that's the picture here is they are so caught up in the opportunity to give that they can't contain themselves. Yeah, yeah. I think we all have a picture, those of us who are parents, one of the things we love more than anything is the sound of our kids' yeah. laughter yeah. or grandkids' yeah. laughter. Um, and uh, we were watching a video last night at home, just uh, pulled something up on the phone and it had Sawyer in there cackling yeah. about something. And, and when I think of hilarious and someone just filled with joy and laughing, that, that's what comes to exactly. mind. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, for me, and that's uh, that's convicting to me. I um, to to give that joyfully mm -hmm. is is something I need to aspire to. Yeah. So, uh, but but this scripture also tells us how not to give. So we're supposed to give cheerfully. How are we supposed to not give? Uh, not giving reluctantly or out of obligation or compulsion. And I found a couple of definitions on these. To be reluctant means to be unwilling or hesitant or disinclined. Kind of like, I don't want to get that out. Uh, I don't want man. to pay that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's reluctant. Or, or obligation, uh, it just means required. Yeah. It, it, it paints the picture of being legalistic. We're only doing it because it's a rule. Right. And again, like you said, it, this is about our heart and our attitude toward Jesus, not necessarily that specific amount. Um, but God wants us to give cheerfully and not legalistically. We're not checking a box. We're not doing it because we can and, and we're doing it in a certain amount, but nothing more because the rule says this amount. Yeah. Um, he wants us to be cheerful givers. And Paul says we'll be blessed and enriched by that in verse 8 and 11. So this is, you know, is that a prosperity gospel? I don't think so. Do you, Jeff? Well, it depends on how you define prosperity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it says that you're going to be enriched, Yeah. but it's all about the heart. You're going to be enriched and it may not be monetarily. Right. Your life may be enriched. Mm -hmm. The joy in your life may be enriched. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that this is partly a prosperity gospel, but it's in the right way. In the in right being way. Prosperity. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, our our heart, um, if it's in the right spot in, yeah. in the way that we give, um, God will bless us with, uh, with peace and with joy and enrichment uh, in our lives. Not out of rules or obligations, right. but by joyful, cheerful giving. That's, that's a great word. Really, really yeah. good. And convicting. Absolutely. Very convicting. Absolutely. Uh, um, when was the last time that I gave hilariously? Cheerfully and hilariously. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's something to think on for sure. Well, to, to wrap this up, we want to not just tell you how we're supposed to do it, but we want to give you just some very tangible steps on, on, on ways that you can progress in your giving and your generosity. So number one uh, is to pray. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this, each person should do as he has decided. We just read this scripture, decided in his heart. So giving is a heart matter. It, it's something that we need to really and truly check our heart. Just as David cried out to God and said, God, I want you to know my heart. I want you to search my heart and make sure that there's nothing bad within it. And that's what we're supposed to be doing here. See, giving is a powerful expression of how God has led us. And this is how we decide in our heart. If God speaks to our heart, it's from the heart then that we give. And that's how we're supposed to give. So pray that God would give you a generous and a willing and not a reluctant, remove the reluctance out of us so that we can give to him the way that, that will bless him and honor him. Secondly, second thing, so pray. Second thing that we can do is to trust. Oof. In today's time, that's, yeah, that can be tough. That I mean, trusting tough. literally means that we're going to let go. We don't like to do that, do we? Boy, it's tough. It, it's tough. We have this this thing in our mind that we want to control everything, and right now it seems like we can't control anything. No. And I think God's trying to teach us something here. <laughs> 
uh, God is always busy. Yeah. Uh, as as the the song we've been singing in worship says, we even when we don't see it, He's working. He's working. Um, and uh, I, I know He's at work, and he, He's probably at work in some mighty ways that we we don't see. Right yeah, we now. have this illusion that we can control things, and uh, it's an illusion. It is. I really can't think of anything other than the way in which I think and I speak, can I control? Mm -hmm. uh, what we need to know and understand is that God is unlimited in his resources. And it, scripture tells us in Psalms 50 verse 10, God owns all the cattle on the hills. And you know what? By the way, he owns all the hills that the cattle are on. Yep. Now, that's kind of a Jeff Wilson translation that's all right. Translation there. But that's, that's a beautiful picture. God has no limitations. There is nothing that, will, that, that is past his ability. And that's what we try to do is we typically, when we give, we look at our, our checkbook or our bank account or our pockets, and we look to see, oh, well, you know, I don't have that much uh, I can't give. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the tangible. Right. Instead of looking at, you know what, God is calling me to do this, and I'm going to be obedient and do that, and then I'm going to let God take care of how everything takes place. And that's where trust comes in. That's trust. That's trust. It's, trust really isn't if you can figure it out. Yeah. I didn't take trust. No. No, it, it, you can be a mathematician if you're that trusting is I'm, I'm, I'm letting go and I'm putting myself and my finances in his hands and I'm going to trust that he's going to be faithful just like he promises. The third way that we can put this into action is by obeying. And I, I, don't, I don't think anybody, else, anybody really likes the word obey because that means that we can't do what we're, we want. Mm -hmm. But what scripture tells us here is that when we're obedient, God blesses. And what, it, what we really, it, what he's asking us to do is to trust him. And we put that trust into practice by action. And that action is giving. And so we can't say, I trust God to take care of everything in my life and not and not give or not obey. That action proves our trust. Okay? It's, it, it's, not, it's not faith. It's not faith. It's faithing. <laughs> we're, we're turning in it into an active verb there. So I want to encourage us all to give, but not just give. Let's, let's push it a little bit. Let's give outside of our comfort zone. Let's give as if this God that we say that we believe in is really as big as he is instead of reducing him down to a small God. Let's give without hesitation. Let's give happily and let's give joyfully. I love this phrase uh, to wrap things up. And I think that this is really good for us just to think and to ponder upon. It's this right here. Your obedience to God is directly related to giving. Are you giving? Then you're being obedient. If you're not giving, then you're being disobedient. Second, your faithfulness as a church member is a function of your giving. So being a part of a local body of believers, being a member of a church, shows that you have responsibility. And by fulfilling that responsibility, it's actually showing that you're truly a church member there. Last is your joy as a believer in Christ is closely tied to your giving. It's very interesting to watch those that give and they give it without hesitation. And they give it joyfully and they give it happily and not reluctantly how joyful those people are when they're truly giving to the Lord. And that kind of goes back to that promise we yeah. just talked about, right? Yeah, exactly. God says, obey me and trust me in this, uh, that, that giving will lead to blessings and, and joy. And, um, man, we still don't like to let go and 
trust him no. on those things. But when we do... It's that illusion of yeah, control. When we do, we, we do experience that joy, yeah. uh, don't we? So yeah, uh, those, those are so tied together. So just, just some takeaways here that we just thought would be good for us just to go through and talk about. One is this. Uh, have you ever noticed that generous people are loved? Oh, yeah. I, I love being around people that are generous. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, I don't know of one person that's stingy that's fun to be around. <laughs> I mean, really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. honestly. And so what type of a person do you want to be? Do you want to be known as being a generous person? Honestly, I had never thought about this until reading this book. Not as far as the generous side. Mm. Think, about, think about your, your death and how people would describe you. Yeah. Would generous be part of their description of your life and the way in which you interacted with them? I think that's a really good thing for us to think of. Yeah, yeah. And, and when we talk about generous people, how do we become that person? Uh, do we want to become that person? Uh, the, the key to that uh, as a takeaway, we believe is to, again, going back to a point we made earlier, r- realize that you don't own anything. Yeah. We don't own anything. It, at most, we are stewards of what God has given us. Everything we have, we owe to him, uh, whether it's a material good yeah. or a, a talent that he's blessed us with uh, that we can use to, to uh, make a living or acquire property or um, uh, to benefit ourselves. And, and he's asking us to be generous with that back uh, to him. So if we start out knowing it's not ours, yeah. that can help us to become that generous person. If we think it's ours and we earned it, and we paid the price for it, I, I love then the, we have trouble getting that out of our pocket. I love this word right here. Mm-hmm. Realize. If you think about the, uh, the prodigal son, mm-hmm. whenever he took all of his, his inheritance, went out, and then he squandered all of it. And then scripture says that he came to the realization mm-hmm. of where he really was. Right. Right. He came to a senses. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think the same thing is here, is we need to come to our senses. We need to realize that everything that, that we have has been given to us yeah. by God. It's all been a blessing from God. And, yeah. and for him to ask for part of it back is, man, we should respond generously. Yeah. One of the things that I think is really good for all of us, because uh, as adults, we have influence over our children. Now I have influence not o- just over my children, but now my grandchildren. And here's a great question for all of us is how do we want our children, our grandchildren, and maybe even our great grandchildren to grow up? Do we want them to be generous? Well, if so, where are they seeing that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I learn so much more by visual and tactile, tactile. Uh, and if I see generosity living out before me, then I can understand what that means to live generously. So a question to us is this, do our children, do our grandchildren, do our great grandchildren see generosity in us? Now you're stepping on toes, brother. Yeah, yeah. mine too, mine too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's convicting to think. What what do the people in our lives see in us? Because yeah. we have, uh, the older I get, the more I realize I've got a different view of myself than maybe the people around me. And, and Boy, you can say that about anybody. Not, that's not easy to learn. No, that's not easy to learn. But you, you, you um, we might we might remember that time we're generous and think we're generous. Yeah. But do people see generosity all the time, all the time. from us? That's yeah. convicting. That's convicting. Well, one thing we want you to do is take some time tonight um, to pray about these things. Um, th- this is a matter of our, our faith, our obedience, our trusting yeah. of God. And Jeff and I are up here not preaching to you folks. We're no. preaching to ourselves yeah. on this. And we'll be praying this same 
uh, group of prayers that we're talking about uh, with you all. We want to pray that God would give us a bold and, and strong faith uh, to give what he lays on our heart to give. Um, you know, and a great starting place in scripture is the tithe of 10%. Um, but, um, you know, I read something this week talking about this, this passage in 2 Corinthians 9. Some people look at it and think, well, it's not really, they're not talking about tithing there. Mm. But uh, Charles Spurgeon uh, talked about that and said, if you're an object of God's grace and mercy uh, through the, the person and work of Jesus Christ, then just what, what, what the material said here, a, a great place to start yeah. is the tithe. If the rule was the tithe, but you, you haven't been given a rule, you've been given grace and mercy over and above that, um, then our giving should be over and above that. But a great place to start is the tithe of 10%. But then pray about giving more. Get a little bit out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And then start looking for those areas where uh, joy is going to enter your life uh, for how you're giving. Uh, look and see how much deeper your walk with Jesus yeah. can become. Uh, I guarantee that's something that you will observe mm -hmm. if you're not giving and you begin giving or if you're giving at a certain level and you can give more into and out of your comfort zone. Um, and then see how much more he gives you to be generous. Yeah. Uh, God loves a cheerful giver and promises blessing uh, to us uh, through that. So, and, and God asks us to test him in this in the book of Malachi uh, about giving to the church. So yep. we ask that you pray tonight about how God would call you to be obedient through your giving. But we're also challenged from that scripture that we read earlier about however much that we sow, mm -hmm. we're going to reap. We're going to reap. And are you sowing greatly and expecting, expecting even more so, or are you sowing very little and still expecting God to bless you greatly? Right. Uh, it's reciprocal there. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a, it, 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 it would be hard for me to move past tonight and to end without talking about how this point in time in our church is being impacted by this world, this crazy time that we're living in right now. And uh, this past week, since we're not able to meet on campus, every time that that happens, our offerings drop. And this past week is one of those times. Uh, whenever we tallied up how much money we, we had that was given to us, both online and then also through people driving up and giving us their, their, uh, their tithes and offerings, via a check or in an envelope or cash, uh, that amount totaled to just a little bit above of half of what our budget needs are. Wow. And so we want to really encourage our church family to give the way that we talked about, the way that scripture talks about faithfully, cheerfully, sacrificially, Yes. Uh, I don't think any of us knows how this is going to play out. But I do know that God is going to be faithful and he's going to reward us when we are faithful to him. And our heart is to utilize these funds that the Lord's giving to us so that we can minister to our church members, but also to our community. And that's difficult for us to do whenever we are only receiving in half of what we need to meet our needs right, right now. So we urge you, we, 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 we challenge you to, to give just as the church in Macedonia gave, and that is to give, give pleading. Can I, can I please come to the church <laughs> and give my offerings to the church because God has blessed me so much. Well, we want to thank you for being with us tonight. We pray that you'll be blessed. We will be having church online again this weekend, and we encourage you to join us either through YouTube or through Facebook Live, or you can find all of that on our website, or you can also watch on cable TV as well. Uh, Matt, would you mind just closing us in prayer tonight? Sure. Thanks, Jeff. 
Uh, Father God, we just uh, thank you for um, all the blessings that you give us. Mm -hmm. uh, even in these uh, crazy times that we are in, God, we see you at work. Um, uh, we, we see you uh, touching lives and um, we see you bringing us together mm -hmm. in ways that we didn't um, take advantage of. Uh, before these times, God. Help us to grow during these times. Help us to um, properly rely on you for mm -hmm. all that we need. Uh, help us to turn to you uh, during these times and, and, and in all the days following. We lift up our leaders uh, that are making decisions, state, mm -hmm. federal, and local. We're thankful for their leadership. Um, we ask that you bless them with wisdom and discernment. Uh, we, we lift up our medical professionals and yes. our first responders who are on the front lines of this virus. And we ask that you give them uh, peace, that you protect them with good health yes, and that you, um, just bless them in a special way, uh, for, for standing there on the front lines in front of us. God, I ask you to, to bless our churches, um, mm -hmm. who carry the gospel message, uh, for you. And uh, we ask that you bless them financially with good giving, not just Severns Valley, but every yes. uh, gospel preaching and believing church in our community. We ask that the, that the faithful members would be faithful in their giving mm -hmm. uh, and that they would receive joy and blessing as you promised because of all that. God, just uh, grow us up today uh, in our faith. Help us to be faithful, trusting and knowing that you are a good and gracious and faithful God. Thank you, Jesus. I pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.